When publishing changes, does society change with it? When comparing the old-fashioned ways of pen to paper with today's instantaneous communication behind the screen, have we inflicted change in our social relationships? There are three main questions we have to ask ourselves when we make such a comparison. What it means and what it meant to be social, whether communication really is valuable anymore, and how the rise of communicative technology is compromising our psychological needs for social identity and interaction. Let's take a trip back in time. Welcome to the 19th century, where the fashion was painful, etiquette was everything, women really did belong in the kitchen, and courting was more than a few drinks and a one-night stand. If you think social networking is out of control today, then be glad you didn't live in the 19th century. Everyone knew everything about everyone else who all knew everything about you. Think Chinese whispers and you'll get what I mean. So what did it mean to be social? Apart from attending the theatre and throwing fancy parties, women spent their days baking and sewing hideous tapestries with other women, while their husbands were out gallivanting on horses playing croquet and smoking cigars. But such activities were more than just entertainment. They were breeding grounds for social identity. They represented your wealth, status and class among society, and the more extravagant your methods of socialising, the higher your wealth and status. Now that we've established the importance of being a 19th century social butterfly, let's get to the nitty gritty part of it all. Today, the meaning of social has changed drastically. We still know everything about everyone else who all know everything about us. But communicating such things is a little different. Putting gossip aside, let's talk meaningful communication. Love letters, postcards home, and that once in a blue moon message from a long lost friend. Pre-1900s, things were done a little differently. Looking at love letters, for example, a letter was the ultimate symbol of passion and emotion between two lovers. That's not to say it still isn't. But when we compare paper to screen, things just aren't quite the same. Think of the last time you received an I love you message from your current lover or perhaps that rotten egotistical ex that ripped your heart to shreds. Chances are you read it off a screen. Email or even more likely a text. It came in one of the following variations. I-L-U-V-U, I-L-Y, or now thanks to iPhone's emoji keyboard, a simple emoticon of a heart. But it all means the same, right? I mean, I love you still means I love you, whether said in the 1800s or now. Just how much can the form of publishing change the meaning? Well, quite a bit, actually. According to psychologists, love isn't just psychological, it's also a physiological arousal stimulated by the senses. A love letter carries with it the stains of coffee and tears. We can see the context on the page. We can feel the indents of the handwriting, smell the scent of the spray perfume, and smudge the lipstick of a sealed kiss. On a screen, it's just a sender in words. The intimacy is lost. The letter may take days or even weeks to arrive, but should sentiment be compromised by convenience? Are we negotiating our relationships for our fast-paced, cluttered 21st century lifestyles? This isn't always necessarily the case. Let's take distance and communication, for example. While we are exploring the nooks and crannies of the world and occasionally feel that pain of homesickness swell, today all it takes is a laptop and a Skype call and we're transformed back into our living rooms. We can see mum's wrinkles and dad's grey hair, see their emotions and hear the voices as if it was real. The only barrier between worlds being the glass screen. Think of it like talking through a window. The internet equivalent of the 19th century was the telegraph, dotting and dashing away your homesickness through a telegram to the other side of the world. It would cost you a dollar for this sentence, stop. Someone on the other side of the world would decode it onto paper, stop. Then the postman would deliver it home the next day, stop. By then, your feelings of homesickness have probably stopped, stop. You get the point. So in that sense, our social relationships can be sustained no matter where we are. Why? Because we can constantly stay in touch. It's almost as if our world has shrunk a hundred times over and a thousand miles away can be right there in our own living room. In saying this though, just because the world has shrunk, it doesn't mean our social relationships haven't drifted apart or changed to say the least. Whether it's Morse's dots and dashes that deliver your message or binary zeros and ones, the real change is not so much how we deliver our messages or how fast they are in our fingertips, the real change lies off the paper and the screen and in the world around us. Since the introduction of the 21st century technology, such as iPhone, tablet and extensive internet that we see today, there has been a shift from the intimate to the superficial. We have built ourselves a world where our friendships are quantitative over qualitative. In other words, one 19th century friendship is probably equivalent to 521st century Facebook friends. Get the math? According to social psychologists, we have replaced our need for mechanical solidarity with gizmos, gadgets and material possessions. 
We've compromised face-to-face -face contact for the online world, and we now live in two worlds at once through an online avatar. And rather than focusing on making the most out of one world, we split our focus into two. Our organic needs, once satisfied by belonging, social interaction and group membership, now waved in a cyberspace universe. We interact with strangers and call them our friends, and our friends seem almost like strangers. These days, it can be hard to differentiate between the two. We spend both worlds surrounded by people we will never know, and paradoxically, the more connected we are to the world, the more disconnected we are from each other. So ask yourself this, who are your real friends?